All right, we'll start today with just a quick review. Just want to remind you, as I see these outlines turned in, one of the biggest mistakes I see is a one without a two. Make sure that you have got at least two pieces of evidence to support any claim. Please don't turn in an incomplete outline with these minor errors. And I know that some of you are just going to make those errors and take a few points off and it's not, um, that big of a deal to you, but I just want to encourage you, if you plan on going on, this could be affecting you for the next four years as you go through your undergrad experience, or if you choose to go on and get your master's degree, these same rules are going to apply. They're not just my rules. So start to learn to play by the game and um, keep your, no need to cost you that five points. Uh, just go back and look at those outline rules. Also, make sure it's standard format. It's scholarly in nature. This is not a piece of art. It's a document used to convey knowledge. So make sure you're not um, just bolding things to make it look, to look pretty or using bullet points rather than the A, B, Roman numeral or letters. Um, I, I also only want black ink. I know that some of you, you know, um, want to make it pretty, but that's not the time or the place. Make your PowerPoint slide pretty. Don't make your outline or work cited. So what do I mean by end in every line after the first? I have some of you going to Easy Bib, which I highly encourage, you know, cut and paste, but uh, make sure you indent that second line. Also make sure you're using MLA format. Go back to that little brown handbook if you have not in a while and re-examine or go to owlpurdue.edu look at the MLA format and make sure that you're following that format. On your title, on your uh, outline, it needs to be in quotation marks and then also when you're doing your work cited and saying a title, that needs to be put in italics or quotation marks. Um, even if it's within the outline, if it is a title of something, you need to set it apart. And once again, uh, it's fine if you use EasyBib, but you have to know how to use it. It's only a tool. It's not going to do this work for you. Once you uh, put in the ISBN number and you get that, first of all, you have to make sure it's on MLA. And then when you cut and paste it onto your outline, you have to indent that second line. It's not going to format it for you. It's not going to put it in 12 point font or uh, put it into Times New Roman right so make sure that it matches the rest of your outline and you can put that work cited right there on the same page as your outline it does not have to be a separate page I don't want to waste any trees not necessarily unnecessarily all right today we're talking about source material right and this may come as a huge shock to you but some newspapers lie <gasps> I know. Uh, particularly the National Enquirer. Very creative. I'm going to tell you about Bat Boy and the 600 pound baby, but they're not the most honest of sources. And they are not the only sources out there that are not honest. Most papers are in it to sell, not necessarily to tell the truth. So uh, today we'll kind of go through some of those sources and where they fall and how you can use them and how you, which ones particularly, you can't use. National Enquirer being one of them. Some of you love quotes there. You love poetry, you love profundity, and I appreciate that. I appreciate your artistic quality. However, right, quotes are sticky, sticky business, um, particularly if you're getting them off goodreads.com. Um, I really suggest that you go to the library, into the reference section, and pick up a quote book, because those have at least been through a publisher. They've been fact-checked already. Uh, most of those quote places now are 2.0. In other words, I could go in and put a, a quote anything and say that Sophocles said it. It doesn't necessarily mean that he did say it, um, it because somebody else said he did. So uh, make sure that you're going to the original source material. Um, the original source material may also have a context, right? You may be quoting Sophocles about the way that he was with Oedipus Rex, but then if you go back and look at the initial story, that was way before he even wrote Oedipus Rex, right? So make sure that if you are um, 
going to use a quote that it is in the timeline and it is relevant to what you're talking about. Um, don't just pick something they said once out of their entire life and apply it to what you want to apply it to if it wasn't in direct conversation about what they were talking about. Um, someone's one time said, right, you need to be careful with that because you don't know the reputation that person has. Um, you may be po quoting a politician who has lost his um, ethos for one reason or another, right? This politician could have ended up being a dictator who killed thousands of people. Well, if you don't actually know who that person is and you're quoting them and someone else in that class, probably not me, knows who that person is, then they're going to lose respect for you because you are claiming the philosophies, the theologies, or the ideologies of this person not knowing who they are, right? Um, if you stand up and say, according to Mussolini, right, then you need to, after your quote, say, well, I know he doesn't have a good reputation, but he may have been smart in this area or something like that. I'm not saying you can't quote someone just because they're considered a bad person by the average American, but um, if you do use someone who's not respected, make sure you tell why. Uh, and, and you know, if you do quote somebody like Einstein, no need to go into a big long backstory about Einstein. It's safe to assume that we know who he is, and that's okay. Like I said, Go to the quote book. Mike Daisy uh, went to China. He is an actor. He went to China and uh, supposedly observed what was going on in these Chinese factories and then came home and wrote a monologue about it. Well, his translator, after his monologue came out, his translator said, no, that isn't what we observed at all. He, he claimed there was this person with writhing hands that were all manipulated from having made your little iPods. And um, the translator came back and said, that's not what we observed at all. And so then in PR, uh, before Mike Daisy had been fact-checked, they had done a big expose on his work. Well, after they figured out that he had just fabricated his sources, that he had just made up this information, NPR, as a credible news source, went back and um, withdrew and had a retraction on that episode and said, you know, Mike Daisy is, is making this up. Well, when push comes to shove, he said, it's my artistic quality I like to embellish. Well, he was lying and he was bringing a lot of negative attention to um, Steve Jobs and the Apple Corporation that was unfair, right? Now, are there people in the world who have bad working conditions? Yes. Does somebody need to bring that up? Obviously, but you can't just make stuff up about other people. That's slander. That's illegal in our country. So um, I think I've used this example before, but it's a good example of how people can lie to the media and the media can believe them. But I'm proud of the National Public Radio, NPR, in that they caught that he was lying and went back and had a retraction. Another thing you need to be aware of is that certain magazine or news sources have a certain bias, and some of them proudly so. If you pick up The New Yorker, Right? It's going to have a more liberal bias. If you turn on Fox News, it's going to have a more conservative bias, and unapologetically so. So if you are going to quote Fox News on any given political issue, say the presidency, um, then you may need to go and find a different source to kind of double check your information. Don't get all of your information on a current issue based on one newspaper article because there's a chance that most newspapers are going to cover the same current issue. So um, I suggest that you use the database. We've talked about that a few times. Go online, go to the library website at mscc.edu, um, go to the database, and then they'll give you, you know, the Washington Post, uh, the Economist, the U.S. News and World Report. Look at a couple different articles and make sure that they're all kind of got a different perspective on the same issue. Because as we all know, if we were all to experience standing on the side of the road and watch the exact same car crash. We would each have a different perspective. We might remember the details differently. We might have caught something that somebody else didn't see. So 
look at several different people's opinions or perspectives on any given issue before you write a speech about it. Because if you go watch one episode of Fox News, come home and write an entire argument based on that one episode, you're probably operating from a sense of bias websites. Yikes! And I know some teachers have altogether outlawed websites use in their class because they've just seen so many bad examples. I do not think that. I, the majority of my research is online. Um, you just have to make sure that you know what you're looking at. What's an auto blog? Um, these are pirates basically. They go and cut and paste information from other credible websites and then put advertisements all around it. So if you click on a website and there are advertisements all over it, there's a good chance it's an auto blog and you need to go back and find original source material. Now the exception to this would be a lot of newspapers nowadays because they are having trouble paying the rent. So if you go to nytimes.com, um, the New York Times, to get information and it has um, you know, advertisements on it, that's just the newspaper source trying to pay the bills, and, and that's okay. But most of the time, if you go and there's too many advertisements, it's not a credible scholarly source. Avoid anything 2.0, right? A Wikipedia uh, can be edited by anybody. I can go in and edit at Wikipedia. And I'm sorry, not yet in the academic circles is this an acceptive, acceptable source material. Now what you can do is scroll down to the bottom of the page and look at the sources for that article and sometimes those sources are very credible and very helpful. But you cannot just say according to Wikipedia. You cannot put Wikipedia as one of your credible sources for the next few assignments. Um, 2.0 just means that anybody can edit it, right? Um, and some websites are very good about making sure that uh, that somebody's watching that to make sure that it gets fixed. In fact, I would argue that Wikipedia has pretty credible fact checkers, but um, still, until it gets really 100%, uh, I'm not going to allow it. Um, also, you want to avoid posting the, the comment section, right? Don't turn to that as source material either. Once again, that could be any um, random silly, serial killer in a different state. Uh, you know, if you want to say one person replied this as a post and qualify that that's what it was, then you can use it as anecdotal evidence, but it cannot be your hard factual evidence. If someone says, oh, I heard 99% of blah, blah, blah. Yeah, don't, don't rely on those speculative sources. <laughs> this is one of my favorites. Um, <laughs> Don't use fiction as if it were fact. If you turn on um, a TV show that's based on real events, well, there's a reason why they have to qualify that as based on. Uh, there's a very high chance that if you're watching The Tudors, well, Henry VIII was actually a really fat guy, and he was not attractive. He Once they put him in the coffin, his body exploded because it, uh, he had so much gout in his body. Um, he did not look anything like the Showtime performer, actor, who's got this rock star mentality. I mean, that's not at all the true story of the Tudors. It may be entertaining if you want some entertainment, but it's not accurate, historically accurate, even though it, it there are some events that are true that are reflected in the Tudors. Um, if you're going to talk about Queen Elizabeth in class, you cannot use the Tudors as your source material. Um, even I'm going to challenge you about using documentaries. Now documentaries are a great place to start. Um, and if it's a really well known, really well done documentary, um, believe it or not, HBO is one of the best places for documentaries. Um, Super Size Me, Weight of the Nation, um, some of these are really uh, solidly done documentaries, but they are biased. Almost always a documentary maker is making that documentary because they have an agenda. So if you are going to use that documentary source, make sure you get the other perspective on the issue before you proceed with your argumentation. If you're quoting, tell me that you're quoting. Even something that you think is so obvious, to be or not to be, that is the question. You think everybody must know that's Hamlet from Shakespeare. Well, as soon as you don't say, right, uh, according to Hamlet, to be or not to be, that is the question, you know, people will get confused. So just make sure you say that you're quoting if you are. And this can get down to plagiarism, um, you know, legality in our school system currently. So please be careful. Uh, 
when you use your source material, don't just say statistics indicate. Uh, I know that some commercials can get away with that, but you don't want to be so vague. Experts say, scholars say, who, which scholar, which expert, which statistic. Say, according to The Economist in June 1st of 2012, be specific. Please don't give me these general experts say. Well, there are lots of experts and usually they disagree on everything if they are an expert. So be, be specific. Um, and also add those dates, especially if currency is an issue. So if you're talking about a cancer, I love the example of the mastectomy in your book. Make sure that you say um, the latest information. Uh, according to a cancer research study that came out in 2011 uh, done by Harvard University you know give those nice specific details so that people can then go back and cross-reference if they're curious about what you're talking about they can go back and look up the source that you're saying now there may be a time when you want to quote um, Miley Cyrus and you want to be cute and that's fine and that's fun but don't cite that you can you should cite it on your work cited but don't pretend that that's a solid piece of ev evidence. If I say you need to have three source materials and Miley Cyrus is one of your source materials, I'm really going to question that, right? Um, make sure that you have enough evidence to support your claim. And right now, I don't require you to cite photos. Um, my lawyer for Motlow may come down on us about that and really require you to cite photos in your presentation and I know some professors who do but for now I'm gonna allow you to cut and paste photos off the internet without giving authorship um, if it is a famous artist uh, you probably need to mention it in your speech so as you might recognize this public Picasso piece uh, that sort of um, specificity is nice uh, but not required yet in my course so there are several different supporting materials, ways that you can support your arguments, your sub-sub points on your uh, outline. So let's just go over some of those. You can speak hypothetically, right? What if you were robbed in a back alley and left on the street with nothing um, but, you know, that sort of hypothetical is considered a supporting material of sorts, right? And then giving actual examples. Right in fall of 2012, uh, a 12-year-old girl was mugged in a back alley in, in Washington State. Those sort of actual historical events can also get people thinking and get people's attention. So a lot of you will need to start your argumentation by telling me what defining your terms, um, giving a scope of your argument, and then also giving me examples. So if you're going to talk about a celebrity, show me a picture of them. If you're going to talk about a political theory, right, then maybe you need to tell me um, what are some famous politicians who've also held this conviction. Etymology simply means the way that the word was came, in, came into being or what words it's related to. Uh, for example, uh, you know, what is the Latin root of the word? Uh, how do they say it in a different language? And how, what does it mean in a different language? It's kind of a fun fact. But sometimes it's very illuminating as to the original nature of it, uh, what it originally means. And that is... Um, referring to history there which can really help us organize things um, and then one of the best ways to tell us what something is is what it does right the best way to describe what something is is what it does I always think about telling an alien what a pin is well, the best way to show an alien what a pin is if an alien a UFO just happened to show up tomorrow and ask me what's that in your hand uh, assuming we can communicate which I think it's safe to do uh, I would show him I would I would write with the pen and say ah see this is what it is imagine that we're aliens when you start your speech and that we have no clue what a quarterback is right we have no clue uh, what an exfoliant is and just going back to that sense of uh, don't use jargon don't assume we know what you're talking about personal anecdote I believe I have beat that horse hopefully by this point you know what a personal anecdote is um, so you can tell us what something is by comparing it 
right? To compare a beautiful woman to a summer's day and say how they are alike poetically. Um, but then you can also give us what it is not, right? A pencil is not a pen. So I will tell you how a pencil is not a pen that can help define what a pencil is. Um, one of the best ways for you to define yourself right now is to say, how am I different from my parents or the people who raised me? How am I like them? You can define yourself by what you're not as well as what you are. Uh, testimonial, right? Um, giving uh, a person's perspective, showing a video of someone who gives money to this charity or someone who works with this charity. Often a celebrity testimonial is has more of an emotional impact than a regular testimonial. Statistics. Sticky, sticky statistics. Be careful at throwing numbers at us. Statistics are important. Um, give me the data and that will be the most objective, uh, but sometimes, uh, but you want to avoid just throwing big numbers, right? If it has more than two zeros, you really need to break that down for us. One quarter of Americans are overweight, or one in four babies die before uh, completing, uh, before, you know, their mother comes to full term. So, w w you know, make sure to dumb it down. One in four is a good way of doing it, showing us a pie chart, as we talked about in the chart section. Um, <laughs> as you look at your sources, here are some questions to ask yourself. Is it current? Now some of this does not apply. If you're researching Abraham Lincoln, you can give me a source from the turn of the century. And there's probably a pretty good chance that it has not changed since the turn of the century. That information about Abraham Lincoln is the same now as it was when Webster wrote it down. So just, um, but if you're talking about something medical, political, those issues need to be current relevance. Does it matter to what you're saying? What will happen for some of you is you'll research everything there is to know about global warming, but then you'll choose to give a speech just on um, gas emissions. But then you'll still open with some talk about uh, industry output for huge manufacturers. Well, I thought we defined this down to just talking about car emissions. That, that may not have anything to do with industry, but you just really think that's a good example or this is a good supporting material. Always make sure that what you're talking about matters to your topic. One of the hardest things for my students to get in the habit of is throwing away some reading. Trust me, a little extra reading is not going to kill you. Once you read it, you don't have to tell everybody exactly what you read. That can just go into your little thought bank and you can pull that up later in conversation. But you'll do some research. Undoubtedly, you will do some research that you will not be able to fit into your argument. And that is okay. One of the best skills you can have is editing and making sure that only the relevant information gets into your speech authority authority is your topic um, have source material with authority I've seen some great speeches that unfortunately didn't have any logical grounds right my student who talked about the Illuminati conspiracy he could not give me one credible source unfortunately now there are other conspiracy theories that have credible sources um, but Illuminati did not so it didn't have any authority because he couldn't find one written source accuracy right are you painting the full picture this can be very tempting to do uh, with political or current events to only tell part of the story right little kids do this how did the lamp get broken it just broke. Well, you're not telling the whole story. It just broke because your football hit it, right? Um, you know, make sure you're telling the full story. If if you're trying to um, glorify a person or an event or an ideal, you got to tell the full picture, even if there's a little bit of ugly there, even if they're not perfect. Make sure that you're accurately portraying them. Um, you know, don't lie. What is uh, its purpose originally? So if I go to Subway and they tell me I can lose weight by eating their sandwiches, well, they're advertising their sandwiches. 
So of course they're going to tell me that I can lose weight. If I go actually look at the caloric intake that I am putting into my body by eating one of their sandwiches, I might find that different, right? The meatball sub is six, uh, 12 inches long, a foot long. That's like three hamburgers in one. I'm not going to lose any weight by eating that. So they're telling me, they're telling me in order to advertise to me. Don't use advertising as a scientific basis because they have an agenda and their agenda does not fit the purpose. Uh, you want to go to government sources, right? Um, you want to go to uh, journalists who have the purpose of informing us rather than trying to sell us something. Um, here are just some other things to think about. Um, what is it in context? Just kind of sum up. Is it bias? Is it sufficient? Are you telling me the whole story? Um, so just a few little reminders if you want to look to your textbook. All right, so um, this may come as a surprise to you. You will be critiquing another student in the class and yourself. So I'll post your video of you giving a speech um, into Vimeo and send you a link to that so that you can watch your speech. And you'll just write me a paper about your speech and how you did. And then of course we'll exchange names in class and we'll talk about this more in class, but uh, you will then write that person a couple page paper just to explain to them how you thought they did the good, the bad, and the ugly. So I'm just gonna give you some very practical advice about what I expect in your critique. The first thing that I'm gonna say is look to the positive because so many students it's easy to find the negative but you need to reinforce good behavior so if someone has a good sense of humor make sure to tell them I enjoyed your jokes you're good at humor so that they keep telling jokes if you don't tell them that then they could edit out their jokes next time and lose a valuable aspect of their um, public speaking persona so uh, listen well you actually need to pay attention while they're talking. If you tune out and you don't hear what they're saying, then you really don't have any business critiquing them. Um, the best thing that you can do in a speech is give them a sense that they have been understood. This is a deep psychological need to be understood. So repeat back to them some of their main points that you really ag agreed with or enjoyed or that you could tell really resonated with them. Um, we've all played the telephone game and know how difficult it can be to be accurate. So perhaps you've, they're finished with their speech, but there was just a couple points that you need clarification on. Go to the source. You have the convenience of being uh, two seats down from them in class. Go ask them, well, what did you mean by this? Or what was that source again? I want to go look that up. I'm curious about it. Um, don't rely on your memory or wait until the night before when you can't double check with them. This is a managerial concept, which is to give them a compliment, a criticism, and then a compliment. So if I was your boss and I walked up to you and said, oh, your hair looks so good, but I really need you to come in to work on time every day. Good job last week on that report, right? And so I gave you a compliment. I snuck in a little criticism, gave you another compliment, and left. Now this has to do with complicated communication theory including recency theory but the main thing I want you to know is that you have to give twice as many compliments as criticisms for someone to be open and accepting of your information if all you do is criticize they're gonna see you as a bully or a negative source and they're not gonna take you seriously so try to be more complimentary than you are negative but still you need to have at least one critique for them at least one thing that you think they did wrong and um make sure to open with compliments and then close with compliments. Don't just ramble or speak vaguely, right? We don't want to just say, good job, or oh, that was horrible. Be specific. Pretend you're me. Be the teacher and tell them exactly what phrase had bad grammar, right? Are they pluralizing where they shouldn't be pluralizing? Are they using ain't and y'all? What exactly in their everyday speech is grammatically incorrect? What is costing them prestige? Don't just say bad grammar. Give an exact quote of what they said. Be tactful. Don't say anything to someone that you wouldn't want say, said to you, um, even if it is the truth. And this is why I give you time to go away and write down and think about it. It is not an oral critique you'll do in class in front of everyone because sometimes if you get put on the spot there, you're going to say it in some way that's ugly. Um, you know, 
don't just say that was boring maybe you can say um you know I think you could have used a little more energy or pick a topic you're more enthusiastic about rather than just saying you're boring right um be thankful and think the best of a person if they blank in their notes don't just say you didn't practice this at all did you although that might be true right they may have been improvising on the spot giving their speech off the top of their head um, but just assume they got nervous don't automatically jump to a place of distrust um, as much as you can think the best of them hope that they're going to do good on their speech as they speak and um, send them some positive energy so if someone says one time y'all or ain't or one little grammar error don't bother to record it because they're human beings and you can account for one little error um, if they use a filler word one time um then that's not that's not something that you need to go on and on about because they're a human being and they're gonna they're gonna use a few filler words what you want to do is only bring out those things that are distracting if they're shifting their feet the entire speech then you need to talk to them about shifting their feet if they use the filler word ah uh, every three seconds they're like ah uh, then Abraham Lincoln moved to ah uh, well then they haven't done their research and they haven't practiced it enough to have a certain flow that's when you need to point it out but if it's just kind of a one-time hiccup uh, forgive it ignore it uh, allow for a certain amount of humanness in your critiquing um, make sure that you give the person page numbers to go to right um, I see that you're having a problem with filler words go look that up on your book on page blah, blah, blah. Uh, they really encourage you to this this and this and this is for some of you who have really good speakers who you don't really have enough to say about just teach them how to overcome the one problem they have by offering lots of advice on their problem be part of the solution uh, I feel like I did that put it at the beginning at the end so anyway today we have talked about research listening and then supporting um, your argument please take a moment to look at all of the worksheets that I've listed in D2L I know you have lots of worksheets this week so I've made the uh, lecture a little bit shorter but make sure you read those worksheets before you take the quiz because a good portion of the quiz material is over those worksheets worksheets um, thank you for listening <laughs>